Schools are closed and everyone is talking about the virus. Children pick up on stress and may respond in different ways than adults. Love, attention, and routine can make them feel more secure. For more tips from Seattle Children's experts to support your family as you cope, live, and learn during COVID, follow Seattle Children's on Facebook or visit seattlechildrens.org. Schools are closed and everyone is talking about the virus. Children pick up on stress and may respond in different ways than adults. Love, attention, and routine can make them feel more secure. For more tips from Seattle Children's experts to support your family as you cope, live, and learn during COVID, follow Seattle Children's on Facebook or visit seattlechildrens.org.
Schools are closed and everyone is talking about the virus. Children pick up on stress and may respond in different ways than adults. Love, attention, and routine can make them feel more secure. For more tips from Seattle Children's experts to support your family as you cope, live, and learn during COVID, follow Seattle Children's on Facebook or visit seattlechildrens.org. Hello, I want to thank you for joining us today for, oh, start my video. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you for joining us today for Parent Maps Talk, Let Go and Let Grow with Lenore Skenazi. Um, Lenore is an old friend of ours and spoke in years ago at Town Hall, and now we're excited to have her on a Zoom with us. She's the co-founder and president of Let Grow, a nonprofit promoting childhood independence and resilience. Ever since her column, Why I Left My Nine-Year-Old, Why I Let My Nine-Year-Old Ride the Subway Alone, she created a media firestorm. Lenore has been declaring that our kids are smarter and stronger than our culture gives them credit for. She's the author of Free Range Kids, the book turned movement that got her the nickname, wait for it, America's Worst Mom. At Let Grow, Lenore oversees school programs and an online community, as well as legislative efforts promoting the idea that when adults step back, kids step up, which is just an important lesson to begin with. Um, for the record, Funny tidbit about Lenore, she also wrote for Mad Magazine. I'd be really proud about that too. Anyway, my name's Elaine Sulkin and I'm the publisher and CEO of Parent Map. For those of you that are not familiar with Parent Map, we're a content rich resource assisting you in your parenting journey. We publish magazines, live events like these. We also have parenting books and um, have loved converting to virtual events to, to share content. So um, a couple of housekeeping rules. Um, number one, we want to let you know that this is being recorded to be used in the future for educational promotion or for promotional purposes. We urge you to ask questions to Lenore and at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q and A feature and we really couldn't do this without you zooming in and with our sponsors. So thank you to our presenting sponsor, Seattle Children's Hospital, as well as um, series sponsors, Pacific Medical Centers, Seattle Jewish Community School, Leg Up, Sleeping Lady Mountain Resort, and Sunshine Music Together. So thank you um, to our sponsors. So with that in mind, um, I'd love to welcome Lenore Hi. to the screen. I, I think, am I here? <laughs> start You're my here video. I gotta I start my, I'm starting my own video start. there. Okay, I'm the master of my fate. Hi there, Elaine, and hi, Brenna, and hi, so, Seattle, I'm guessing, hello. Yeah, so good to see you, Lenore. It's been a long time and- I know, really, really long. One of, the, one of the, a lot of us are, are getting overwhelmed with Zoom and the lack of intimacy. I would love it to just start with you painting a little bit of a picture of the place where you are. Oh my gosh, I'm in such an oddball um, part of the world. So normally I live in New York City, in Queens, not just in Queens, but in Jackson Heights, not just in Jackson Heights, but down the street from the hospital that you guys know from, from terrible COVID uh, disasters. So was ours, we were considered the epicenter of the epicenter after you. <laughs> and so I'm very happy that we spend our summers in something that's called a bungalow colony. I didn't know what it was either. It turns out that bungalows are tiny little cabins um, clustered together. And there used to be hundreds of these colonies throughout the, uh, the Catskills to the point where the Catskills were known in the 30s, 40s, 50s as the Jewish Alps because the, the Jews in the teeming slums of Brooklyn were boiling hot and also worried about polio. So the, the families would decamp for the summer and spend their time in these cute little cabins. The dads would come up on the weekends 
uh, if you ever saw the movie A Walk on the Moon, the mom would have an affair with the blouse man who was Viggo <laughs> Morgenstern or whatever his last name is, which is so great. But actually the, the, the blouse man no longer is part of the scenery here. People have cars. And it's just a very easy, free range place to raise your kids because um, during the summer when we're here, I think this might have made me the free range mom. We've gotten here so long since our kids were very young. The kids all run around, they're in a pack. There's children, you know, the three year olds are playing with the 10 year olds and the 16 year olds are organizing the, the actually there is, there's a 14 year old this summer who is running the, uh, a production of Grease. And, you know, she decided, why don't I do this? And she put out an invitation and people came and, and auditioned. And it just shows you how much the kids can do and how much they want to do when they're given a little freedom. And I, I think that's what we're pretty much talking about today. COVID, as horrifying as it is in all the obvious ways, is also kind of subversive when it comes to parents because as parents, a lot of us have been putting our kids in, you know, they go to school all day, and then there's the after school enrichment, and then there's homework, and then there's the reading log, which you have to fake with different color pens, because it's so horrible, and you don't want to make your kid do it, or maybe you are making your kid do it. Either way, there's just a lot of structure and supervision in kids' normal lives. And obviously with COVID, with there's no more school, there's no more soccer, and, the, and there's no more sanity, <laughs> the parents have lost it. And so the kids are off doing so much more on their own that they never did before. You know, we started Let Grow with the mission to push parents a little bit to the side just so that they could see how amazing their kids could be when they were allowed to do something on their own, unstructured, unsupervised. And obviously we didn't expect it to be 16 hours a day for four months straight with a horrible virus raging outside the door, but that's what we've gotten. And the upshot is I'll bet a lot of your listeners uh, are seeing sides of their kids, some bad, but a lot really good that they didn't even know their kids were capable of. And I, I think you know, we did a survey and we asked parents to just, you know, a, a big list of things that they could put down. I, I stand, saved it here, like, are your kids, uh, are, when you see your kids, are you reassured, proud, worried, annoyed, disheartened, disappointed? And the number one word was proud. And number two was grateful, impressed, optimistic, and reassured. So they picked the five good adjectives before the five lousy ones. And that doesn't mean that every second is fun. It sure isn't. I'm surrounded by all these parents going crazy, but they're also seeing their kids blossom in, in ways that wouldn't have happened. I, I, they wouldn't have happened. So, so one of the questions um, that came in, and, and maybe you can frame this with giving a little bit more background about the mission behind Let Grow. Thanks. And, yeah. you know, not everybody is familiar with, you know, free range parenting and give a little background about that. And while also, you know, while also really recognizing parents' anxiety around, you know, competition and expectation in school performance and That's learning. So, big, so yeah. the framework of, you know, with COVID, there are silver linings, but we're your yeah. age around kids falling behind and falling apart. Right. So first of all, the falling behind part is pretty easy to reassure us all because everybody's falling behind. <laughs> there's, there's no school now for anyone. And so if your kids missed out on the last three months, so did everybody else. So I wouldn't so much worry about where they are in terms of other kids and are they going to do well. But of course, that's how we've been sort of trained to think about our kids is that um, we have to keep helping and sort of pushing and um, enriching their lives with us and with other adults and with activities all the time because we think that's what's going to get them ahead. But the more we've delved into it, um, and it's not just me who runs Let Grow. Let Grow is a consortium of people um, founded by Dr. Peter Gray, who studies the importance of free play in kids' lives, unstructured play, adults someplace else, what do kids do? And um, Jonathan Haidt, who wrote the book, The Coddling of the American Mind, sort of worried about the fragility of kids when they're getting to campus. You know, they might have great grades and they might write wonderful essays and they do. My God, I just, we just had an essay contest at Let Grow and there were amazing essays. But the ability to roll with some punches, to, to recover from an argument with your roommate, to deal with the mouse in the corner, there seems to be a little less of a shock absorber for kids. And part of the reason we believe is that because there, we've, we encourage children to always turn to an adult when there was a problem. And sometimes it was good. You know, you wanted them not to suffer if they were being bullied or something, but sometimes it was a little much, you know, let me, let me help you with this. Actually, there was a woman who once wrote to um, our blog 
with this cool observation. She had a child with special needs uh, who was in kindergarten. And that kindergarten was across the hall from the neurotypical kindergarten. And she said on her side, all the parents were going, come on, you can do it. Yes, you got your backpack off. Or, okay, where does that go? That's right, you put it in the cubby. And on the other side, the parents of the neurotypical kids were saying, here, honey, let me do that for you. Oh, let me, here's your sandwich. Let me put it in the cubby. Don't forget to say hello to Mrs. Stein. And it was, it was the, the people who had children who had special needs still understood what has always been the role of a parent, which is to gradually step back so that your kid can succeed as much as possible. And, and the success depends on them doing some things by themselves, for themselves. But on the other side, I feel like we've had this culture, I never blame helicopter parents. I think we have this crazy culture that has insisted upon uh, driving us to the point where we think that kids can't do anything successfully on their own. And so those parents had been taught by the parenting magazines and by the, you know, a million experts that they should always be showing their kids that they care and that they're there and they're not going to help, you know, they're not going to let them fall. And they sort of went overboard by doing things so much with them. And to the point where over the past generation or so, as kids have had less and less free time, more time in the, in the after school activities, more time at school, school year got longer over the last two generations. They're, they're, um, their feeling of being in control of their lives, what's called their internal locus of control has gone down. And of course, if you don't feel like you're in control of your life, if you feel like everything is gonna be hard or too much for you, or you need somebody else to help you, that's, that's a depressing feeling. And um, so depression and anxiety have been going up in kids' lives, even as free time and self-direction have been going down. And so Let Grow was founded to make it easier for parents to understand why stepping back a little is good for your kids. And then also to do it, because <laughs> you can think about it. There's an expression, um, a lot more people change their minds after changing their behavior than change their behavior after changing their minds. So you can think, oh, that sounds good, but how am I gonna do it? I don't wanna be the one mom sending my kid to the park and there's all the other moms are you know, like, I don't think she really cares or what if she got abducted or I'm calling 911. So you have to make it normal again and easy for a parent to let go. And so let go, you, you said it at the beginning of this uh, seminar or whatever we're in webinar, uh, it's let go and let grow. Because when we do let go, when it becomes easier for us to let go, the more we let go, the more we're amazed by our kids. And that's the upside of the COVID, that parents have to let go. They can't do everything with or for their kids, even though their kid is right there, you know, you got something else to do. Six, you know, you can't be there entertaining them 16 hours a day. And so that's where the, the, the blossoming comes in. It, the, the, a great segue to a question that just came in. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, there's, look, I see a little how one under Q&A. give kids freedom, but still set boundaries and consequences? We let our seven-year-old have free reign in our four-block neighborhood, which was great, until she let our entire neighborhood, she, wait. What? She, I can't she wait. Our neighborhood girl on an exploration adventure up a hillside, got lost, didn't know where they were. So it's the balance between... Right. Well, first of all, you're the parent. You get to be the adult. You're allowed to set boundaries and you're allowed to set consequences. It sounds like she did something that you had specifically agreed she wouldn't do. I got to give her a little credit because it's kind of cool that she was had that adventurous spirit and it wasn't quelled yet. Um, uh, what I like to do, you know, what all the experts, I'm never an expert in parenting. I'm more an expert in fear, but they always say make the consequences sort of fast. So if she did it that day, say, okay, so tomorrow you can't go out or tonight you're not gonna be able to go out again with the friend, or you have to write an apology to the mother of the other kid. You know, make it happen and then, you know, give her another chance because this wasn't like she was, you know, going out with a BB gun and shooting squirrels. She was just a little excited. And the thing about getting lost is something that really interests me. And I, I wanna pause for a second and just talk about that experience. First of all, she's gonna remember it. She's gonna remember it forever. And I think there's a reason that we remember these things. Uh, I once had a, a, a room full of educators. Um, you know, there were, there were teachers, superintendents, and principals. And I asked them to tell me exactly this kind of story. Can you remember a time when something went wrong uh, when you were uh, outside on your own? And 
um, one mom told one, one I don't know if she's a mom, one supervisor <laughs> told me about the time that she'd been riding, she'd been taking her bike and riding it down this really fast hill. It was covered with pine needles. So it was very slick. And, you know, they kept doing it, her and her friend, and it was fun. And then one time she's going down and she's squeezing the handlebar brakes and the handlebar lifts off the bike. <laughs> so, it's like a cartoon. It's like, hmm, I'm pressing these. It doesn't attach to anything anymore. So she had a split second to figure out what she was going to do. And what she did is she threw herself off the bike into the bushes, got all scraped up and proceeded to get back on the bike and do it again. And then there, there was another guy there who told the story very proudly, I would say, of a time that he was playing mumbly peg, which is the world's stupidest game. You know what it is, Elaine? No. It's so dumb. It's when you take an, it's, it's a guy thing. I really think it is. Uh, where you take a knife, like a little, you know, folding knife, and you throw it down and you have to get it as close to the other person's foot or maybe to your foot, whatever it is. It's a knife heading down towards the ground. And of course there are feet there. And this one went into the foot of whoever he was playing with. And so the, the group of boys had to like take the kid and they sort of surrounded him and shuffled him up the, you know, inside and up the stairs, you know, threw him in the shower, got the thing wiped off, washed off the blood, put on a Band-Aid and sort of shuffled him back downstairs, hoping that nobody would notice. And when I asked them, um, what did you tell your parents? Uh, do you know what they said? What? <laughs> they, they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, and then you ask why. Okay, why didn't you tell your parents? And the answer is this, because they, they cherished their freedom so much. They didn't right. want it taken away. And so this girl going far out, defying her parents, getting lost, there's something to be said for that moment as a defining one, as like, look, okay, I got lost. It was confusing. Maybe it was a little scary, but I survived. I did it. And, and I think that um, I, I mean, I can tell you stories about people getting lost all day because people like telling these stories. She's going to tell that story someday. Don't make the punishment so bad that it turns into a horrible story. Uh, it'll be one where she's a little bit proud in the future, right. recognizing I'm the girl who I, I didn't even just go beyond on my own. I got an, I'm a leader. I got another kid to go with me. So, so I feel like we're doing a disservice to our listeners to not take them back, even though your kids are now in their 20s. Oh, yeah. But, you know, why I let my nine-year-old ride the subway alone yeah. is such an important pivot in your life, of course. Yeah. yeah. And then I think it's, I think it's essential to kind of retell it. And there's so much about oh, sure. today that is kind of throwback. Yes, exactly. Yes. Now is a very throwback moment. Yeah. It's like Pepsi with real sugar. Um, so, so here's the deal. Uh, we have two children. Our older one had never asked us if he could take the subway by himself. Um, but when our younger son was nine, he did. And he started sort of lobbying for it with me and my husband. And we live not in the summers, obviously, but in the, in the rest of the year, we live in New York City. And that's how we get around is by the subway. It's very, it's, it's common, it's safe. It's, it's just, a, it's woven into the fabric of life. How do you get anywhere? You take the subway, we didn't have a car. So um, finally, after the umpteenth bag, my husband and I talked about it and we decided, my, my husband, do you hear about America's worst dad? Like never, <laughs> nobody cares. He's a dad, yay. Uh, we decided that we were gonna let him do it uh, because he could read a map and he speaks the language and he's on the subways all the time and he felt ready and we thought there's something to honoring that. You know, you don't want to turn your kids into little bonsai trees. I know you're ready to grow, but I think you're cuter this way. So one sunny Sunday, I took Izzy, that's his name, with me to Bloomingdale's, which is a fancy department store where he hadn't been before, because why would you take a kid to Bloomingdale's? And I left him there, telling him it was the day. He, he knew that it wasn't just, wasn't just looking around and mom had disappeared. And I went home one way, and he sure enough went into the subway. As we later found out, he got a little lost. There's that theme again. Um, and asked a stranger, which I, I recommend talking to strangers. You can't go off with strangers, but you can talk to strangers. He asked them, is this the downtown side? The guy said, no, you got to go this way. Is he, whatever he did, he obviously got home um, on the subway and then on a bus ride across town. And when he came into our apartment, he was, he was on cloud nine. He, he was taller. He was proud. And he was proud of two things, I think. One is He's Christopher Columbus, right? He made his way, you know, on this d dangerous hero's journey and he, he came home. But I think he was also glad that we saw that he was ready, that we trusted him. 
and the mom of the kid who's the, the seven-year-old who went beyond, I think that, you know, you can do the same. You, you don't have to trust her immediately, but if, if she was capable of getting a little further and she can prove to you that the next time she goes out and she'll be home and you say the time, two hours, she's allowed to prove to you that she's capable and ready for that too, even if she screwed up the first time. So I, I wasn't going to write a column about is he taking the subway, and I didn't for like a couple months afterwards because it wasn't a publicity stunt and it wasn't uh, a social experiment. It was just life, you know, kids getting a little older, doing new things. Um, but I'm a newspaper columnist by trade. And uh, one day I didn't have anything to write about. And I asked my editor, should I write about is he taking the subway? The other fourth grade parents were going to wait, I always say, till they're kids were a little older, like uh, 36, 37. And she said, yes, go write it. I wrote it. And two days later, I was on the Today Show, MSNBC, Fox News, and NPR, and eventually Parent Map, um, <laughs> talking about this decision and what it means to, to not let your kids do anything by themselves. And this whole time, my, my, that, that subway rider is now 22. He's living on a sort of Amish farm now. I can't say that this, you know, let your kid take the subway and someday they'll be living on an Amish farm. I'm not sure that's going to sell a lot of books or even the let grow movement, but it's, it's worked for him and it's worked for us. And it is working for a lot of people who want to give their kids almost this old fashioned throwback childhood that they cherish, you know, not having their parents with them all the time, having some time that is totally wasted because to them it wasn't wasted and yet we've been told that any moment that your kid isn't learning something that you can uh, measure or put on a resume you know that's wasted time but I would ask all your listeners to think back to their own childhood you can do this now for a second or two and think about something that you absolutely love doing that didn't get you anywhere right <laughs> didn't didn't, uh, didn't get you a job, didn't get you a grade, didn't get you a promotion, didn't get you your husband, just, just something that made you you. And so um, that's what our kids are getting a lot of now. And I think it's hard for parents to recognize that this is valuable too, but it is. I, I, it's a, it's, that's a interesting vantage point when we're in such a you know, hyper expectation time. And I mean, everyone is feeling this, the benefits of this implosion to revisit what is learning, you know? And I, I think that you can even talk a little bit more about that, like parents being less freaked out and acknowledging yeah. and seeing more of the places. What does that look like? Seeing your well, kid uh, acknowledging their learning. Well, I'm, I'm going to show you how hard it is to acknowledge it first. Uh, I was talking to one of my very favorite educators. Uh, he's a teacher out on Long Island. Every year he has his class do the Let Grow Project, which any school can do. It's free. The instructions are on our website. Everything is downloadable. And the Let Grow Project is this. You uh, tell the kids that their homework assignment is to go home and do something on their own. You know, they can walk the dog, they can make dinner, they can run an errand. Anyways, he had great experiences and all his third grade kids were doing cool things. They learned to make tortillas. One of them taught her sister how to ride a bike. One kid made an amphibious vehicle, don't ask, but everybody in the class was very excited to hear about the iterations because it kept sinking until finally it didn't and everyone was excited. So here's a teacher who really understands the value of learning that isn't book learning. And he actually said that the kids by third grade, this was the, the part that I didn't know because I'm not a teacher. He said that by third grade, you can usually tell if kids are going to sink or swim already academically. And with the Let Grow Project, which is sort of like letting kids have free time now, um, kids had a way to succeed even if they weren't the kid who would ace the spelling or the vocabulary test. So it was a real way to, hmm. um, for kids to see themselves in a new light, be excited about going to school, have something to share with their friends, even if they aren't doing well academically, even if they don't have a ton of friends, but they made the amphibious vehicle. Anyways, I, I preface my story by telling you that this wonderful teacher, Gary, um, really understood the importance of non-academic learning as a way of a kid coming into their own and, and um, being able to succeed. So then Gary's talking to me about his own kid. And he said, but my kid, who's, oh God, I think 11, but possibly 13, um, 
was doing the opposite. He was using this opportunity. He was always sneaking off online and he was taking the phone, hiding the phone and bringing it into the bathroom so that he could listen to podcasts. I'm like, okay, about what? He said, cars. It's just listening to podcasts about cars. And that's all that interests him. And he's really interested in the infinity for some reason. He really wants to take down the infinity. I'm sorry if there are any infinity out, out there, owners out there. Um, anyways, and what the boy wanted to do and ended up doing was to start a blog called, you know, like the Infinity Car Buyers <laughs> Disaster Guide or something like that. But in any event, he took all this information in. He started a blog. He created it. That's, you know, takes a little doing. And he had a blog post on there. And it wasn't until Gary and I were talking about it that he stopped being mad <laughs> at the kid and recognized, wait a minute, that's learning. And it, to me, it's so obviously learning because that's all I talk about. But look at, you, if you take a step back and you stop demonizing screens, you can see all the learning that was going on. Here's a subject that really turned the kid on. Okay, it's not biology, it's not French history, but it's cars, that's a subject. He's doing his research. He's gathering it. He's sifting through it. Then he's synthesizing the research. Then he's creating something. He's writing. How hard is it to get most boys to write? I have two boys. Really, really hard. And so it, it almost took, even for Gary, a moment of stepping back and thinking, I can't keep thinking of education as just what's on a test. Education for the rest of us, we haven't been, most of us haven't been in school for a long time and we keep learning things. We read the newspaper, we watch the news, we read a book. Why? Because we want to be educated. We want to learn things and synthesize with the information that we get. Well, that's what kids are doing even if it looks like, my God, all he's doing is making origami animals, or she sure bakes a lot of muffins, or why is she riding around on her bike all the time? Well, they're observing and they're learning and they're growing in ways that they couldn't before. And, and if you'll allow me to blather on one more second, I have a good story. Please, please. Okay. So I, I interview moms and I actually, if anybody wants me to talk to them or has a good story, I hope that you'll write to me. I'm Lenore at Let Grow. L-E-T-G-R-O-W dot org. And Elaine, you can put it on your site. Um, but anyways, I was interviewing one mom uh, about how, you know, how life was in COVID. And she used to be a school counselor. Now she's a stay-at-home mom. Her daughter's seven years old, first grade. And she said, before the pandemic, every morning was like this. Come on, Darlene, you got to wake up. Darlene, Darlene, you're still asleep. Oh my God, I can't believe it. Come on, come on, you gotta hurry. Come on, we're gonna be late. Oh my God, get up. Okay, I'll make your breakfast. You just get up. We gotta hurry. If we're not out the door at 703, we'll be at the back of the line, blah, blah, blah. So every morning, this was the miserable and, you know, for both parties, routine. Everybody was tired and cranky and felt out of sorts. They'd been asked to do things they didn't wanna do. The mom was making the breakfast and the kid was being dragged out of bed. Blech, okay, blech. So then, COVID. Mom starts sleeping in in the mornings. The girl starts getting up in the mornings before mom. And what does she do? She goes downstairs, she gets out a bowl, she pours in her cereal, pours in her milk, eats it calmly or not calmly. I have no idea how she eats it, but she does it by herself. And then, not every morning, but some mornings, she then gets a banana and a little yogurt. And then she toasts some bread and butters it and makes breakfast for her mom. <laughs> and uh, Elaine, the thing that I think is so remarkable about that obviously very small story is that that toast butterer was always inside that seven year, that cranky recalcitrant babyish seven year old. Um, but, you know, kids are like seeds. They're, you know, they have all this potential, but seeds need water. And for kids, Free time is the water. Beautiful, beautiful. That, you know, I mean, that again, you know, it really is a little bit of the silver lining of the moment if parents can model more patience and, and give that opportunity. So an, another person just asked a question. Oh, look, um, there's three questions. I'm four-year-old twins are ah, not- Don't ask me about four-year-old twins. Oh, my God. <laughs> right. and Next. I, mean, I think the question really is focusing on keeping, I don't know how familiar or you, know, you are with Montessori education, but she's asking about keeping them in through elementary school because of the practical skills, sense of responsibility. I'm not sure if there's really a- 
there's not a yes or no answer to this. Yeah. Um, I didn't send my kids to Montessori school. I sent them to public school. Uh, Let Grow's executive director has her five-year-old daughter in Montessori and loves it. From what I've heard of Montessori is that there is a lot of emphasis on what kids can do and patiently holding yourself back. And Tracy, our executive director, tells the story about one mom had come to observe a class, I guess, of kids about that age, and they were sewing. And the kid was trying to get the thread through the needle. And you, the mom just kept wanting to go, you know, I can do that. I'll just lick it and stick it. And it's like, but the mom's holding herself back. And I have a feeling that the Montessori teacher is sort of glaring at her. And sure enough, after an infinitely long time to an adult, the kid gets the, the needle threaded. And what the teacher told the mom was that, see, this way you didn't take that away from her. Mm. So... Um, it's sort of like now the kid is making the breakfast or now the kids are riding their bikes. Uh, you know, our, our unofficial slogan at Let Grow is, you said it earlier, um, when adults step back, kids step up. I think Montessori understands that, but I don't think that that's the only option. I mean, you know, you can certainly do that in your side life if you, you know, send your kids to public school or any place else. Yeah. Trusting them with some free time and with some responsibility is really, really um, enriching. So I would say the theme of the next question is one of the toughest and, you know, kind of the opposite of the COVID-19 silver lining, which is how much time kids are spending on screen and especially yeah. tween teenage boys, you know, tying the concept of so much screen time and they don't, and they may not have a hobby and how parents right. can, you know, maybe navigate some of that because right, right. you can't no, it's... push them outside and right yeah i have so many thoughts on this because it is tough um one thing i heard when i was doing a, a webinar with a woman who is a who runs a camp uh just one very practical suggestion before i get into the philosophical side of kids and gaming is set aside some time not that you must be off the screen but that's outdoor time remember kids from one to four every day is outdoor time oh look it's outdoor time so it's not you saying, how come you're on that horrible screen or you're rotting your brain? It's just, that's part of the deal. Just like they would go to school normally from nine to three, outdoor time is one to four. Maybe in the summer, it's one to six. You know, people always talk about their, their childhoods when their mothers would lock the door behind them. I, I didn't have that childhood, did you? No. Yeah, right. But anyways, it seems fair. And you can set two times. You can say, you know, from one to three or from one to four. And then again, from six till the, the street lights coming on. And- you know, as much as kids want to be online together, I, I think there's a reason. Part of the reason, of course, now is that it's so hard to get together any other way. And even before COVID, that was true because we started making it difficult for kids to, you know, go, don't gather at the mall. That's dangerous. I don't want you going to the park by yourself. And there were so few opportunities for kids to gather as they always have without the parents or the adults right there that online became this de facto mall where they could gather. And the, the, the thing about screens is there's a couple thoughts. One is that not all screen time is the same. And Peter Gray, who is our co-founder, who wrote a book about how kids learn through play, you know, there's a lot that they can be getting out of video games. Video games would be really boring if they were so easy. That's why we can't stand playing. I mean, I can't stand playing Go Fish or Uno. It's because, oh my God, this is just painful. And so you need to have a little bit of difficulty, you know, not so hard that you can't, I can't, you know, I can't build a car, um, but I could learn to play checkers a little better. And so don't think that there's no growth going on because there's always growth going on when you're concentrating and trying to get better at something. But the other thing about boys and video games is I got to tell you a story about, um, that was told to me by a friend, Barbara Sarneka. She's a professor of, I think, psychology at the University of California, Irvine. She's done all sorts of interesting studies in childhood independence, but this was her own kids. And she was listening to them. She has two boys. One's like 19 and one was about 15. And the 15 year old and the 19 year old play the same game. And let's say it's, uh, let's say it's Fortnite. I don't really know what it is, but that way we have a game. So the 15 year old was saying, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to get that free upgrade that you can get if enough people, <coughs> excuse me, recommend you. And um, his brother said, no, don't do that now. And the 15 year old said, why not? He said, nobody likes you. It's like, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, you keep killing people when you don't have to. Um, you're making rude remarks. 
you never join in when it's the group that's going to try to storm the castle or whatever it was. And so people think you're obnoxious and they don't like you. They won't vote to give you the free thing. And the 15 year old goes, oh, okay. And because the advice was given within, like as gaming instructions, right? Not as social emotional learning, you know, you must, you know, increase your empathy and let's try that with these experiments. It was, it was like, here's how you're going to get that $20 thing for free. Wait a couple months after you've made more friends and stopped shooting people gratuitously and joined more alliances and been more of a team player and encouraged others. And, and that, that boy became a better kid because of the video game. And of course, because of the instruction that a fellow gamer was giving to him. So, you know, we're, I mean, me, you know, a, a lady, I tried playing one video game at the beginning of COVID just to, so I would be able to say I'd played one and I kept running my, my warrior kept running into the wall. I mean, you know, I just, it's like, it was really hard to keep him on the path. And frankly, I kept getting the same prize again, because I couldn't send him down the other path. And so th there is a learning curve. So cer certainly they're learning something to begin with, but this is their this is their world now. They're not going out and playing cops and robbers uh, and they're not shooting bears in the woods. So this is okay. I mean, get them off of it some of the time. Peter talks about a study that was done of kids online at the time where they were asked, would you rather be playing a game online or outside with your friends? And 80 something percent of the kids said outside with my friends. But that has just become so untenable in so many places that they're there as the second best choice. So don't freak out about it. Uh, so many other kids are there. They're learning a lot of good lessons along with probably some profanity. What can I say? <laughs> um, what, tell us some of the things that you're hearing from parents, you know, just, you know, their concerns, their stressors and mm -hmm. how they're navigating it and recognizing that you're a little bit in an, in an idyllic spot. So maybe- I am because there's a chance for- Right, totally non-representative, but but it is in terms of like you can recreate something like that in your own neighborhood. So right now, yes, what's idyllic is that the teenagers have started a camp for the little kids. The parents are so sick of their kids, they can't wait. You're going to take them away. Great. Feed them marshmallows. I don't care. <laughs> take them away from nine to three. I'll be happy. And the kids are making a little money. And of course, little kids love to be around big kids. But as it turns out, big kids like being around little kids too, because it brings out your empathy. And in fact, when, when school is normal, we recommend a let grow play club before or after school where mixed age kids just play together. Nobody's organizing the game. Nobody's solving the spats. There's just an adult in the corner with an EpiPen, but otherwise the kids are playing. And all these good interactions build character in the kids, empathy and communication. But what I am hearing is that it is an endless time. <laughs> you know, there's almost no distinction between the weekend and the week and you used to get a break. I mean, as much as we wanted our kids to get something from the chess lessons and the soccer, we got something too, which was an afternoon often, you know, free to pursue our own, you know, career or other interests. And so parents are exhausted. Um, they are worried about the screen time, but I hope I've allayed a little bit of that fear. And they worry about the social emotional growth of their kids because they're stuck in a house. Sometimes there's you know, just one kid or sometimes it's the two kids. Um, so, what can I say? It's hard. We're in the middle of a, you know, a cultural catastrophe. It's, you know, all generations, most generations have had to go through something horrible, whether it's a depression or a war or a pandemic. And sometimes you think like, what made the greatest generation, the greatest generation? They got through it. <laughs> you know, nobody loved it. They got through the war. They got through the depression. They got through the Cuban Missile Crisis. So be easy on yourself, I would say. Don't expect yourself to be a little Miss Sunshine all the time or always coming up with something interesting. And then the, the only thing that's going to make your time easier is getting your kid used to being independent and them starting to find things that interest them. And I should say that when we did our study of kids describing how they felt, the number one thing they wrote was bored. <laughs> they are bored. Of course they're bored. But boredom is so painful that eventually, if you're not solving their boredom, eventually, and it's painful for us too, because you got to listen. I'm, I'm hard. I listen to the kid next door. I can hear them all the time. Um, I'm bored. Uh, then they start doing something. And it could be, you know, riding their bike. I'm going to make cookies. Well, you made cookies yesterday. I'm going to make more cookies. 
Um, I'm going to FaceTime my friend. I mean, they will find their interest. And I cannot tell you how many kids have started riding bikes. You must have seen this. Uh, yeah. There was, the other day I saw a, a, a dad teaching, I hope it was his kid, it was a, a young woman. <laughs> she looked about like 15, um, how to ride a bike. Because now they're, you know, that's a classic thing to do when you're bored. You ride your bike around the neighborhood. Where'd you go? Out. What'd you do? Nothing. And that was a classic book when I was growing up. And that also described what I did. And I would ride my bike to the park and there's no one there. And I would stop and I would look for four leaf clovers or I would, you know, go on the swings for a little while. It's not that everything was so, um, uh, so great. <laughs> Every moment of their life doesn't have to be great. It's kind of good, uh, a good training for the rest of your life where not every moment will be great or somebody will be entertaining you. And it is much easier if there are other kids around. And so if you, with another family that you trust, I'm sure you've talked about this before, you know, you think that they're quarantining well enough mm -hmm. and you know that you're quarantining well enough and you trust each other, then those kids can play with each other and they can even be close to each other if everybody's been quarantining. Because it's much easier for kids to entertain each other than for you to entertain them or for them to entertain themselves. So I'd say try to find, and it don't, don't worry about being the same ages. There's, there's a famous case in New York where the mother, it was a private school, private preschool, and the mother of a four-year-old sued the school because the four-year-old was spending a lot of time playing with two-year-olds. And the mother was like, how is she going to get in you know, Ivy League school if she's held down by these little nippers? And um, what she didn't understand is that you want the four-year-old playing with the two-year-old because the four-year-old can be the boss and learn how to explain what she wants done and give everyone their roles and really be a leader. And those two-year-olds want to be like this incredibly giant four-year-old, like if only they could be as cool as her. And so everybody's getting something out of it. Don't worry if you have a seven-year-old and there's just two five-year-olds, the four-year-old twins next door when they're not in Montessori, that's going to be, it's going to be good for everybody. I, th this is a great segue actually into another question. And okay. I think this is particularly hard. Oh no, for, I guess this calls for a rubber band. <laughs> first, put it on. Oh. <laughs> for first time parents, and, it, and it's your only child. And this parent is asking, I am really having a hard time figuring out how to start letting go of my three-year-old. Yeah. Wait, I feel like um, I have to readjust my headset because of the broken head, which was a disaster. <laughs> Three-year-olds are hard to let go of because they keep coming back. <laughs> no? <laughs> right? Right? Um, so um, once again, this is going to be a case for it's easier if you have some help. Because if you're the only playmate for your three-year-old, it's going to be very hard to let go, even when you are bored out of your mind, because they don't have the wherewithal to entertain themselves. First of all, I'd say, don't worry about some screen time, give yourself a break. There's all sorts of interesting things on screens. Screens are today, you know, I always think that, you know, Gutenberg came along and people were starting to read books and it's like, why aren't children reading scrolls? When I was young, they read scrolls. That's the way to get information. And so I feel that's a little bit about the screen too. I mean, they can be learning anything from their letters to their languages. Why, why does uh, Sesame Street exist if not for three-year-olds? So first of all, give yourself some break with that time. Secondly, find another kid or find a babysitter that you can trade off with. Maybe you'll take two kids over at your house and then you can send your kid over to another house. And then the one thing, and this is really obvious, but I only read it the other day and, and I thought it was a, a good uh, thing to pass along, which is when your kid is absorbed in doing something, say you've taught her how to wash the dishes or she's you know, giving her doll a bath or let's do so, or playing with a stick. Skip playing with a stick. Let's go back to the, you know, playing with the dolls or whatever. I, I still, I see people even here surrounding me saying like, oh, now you're playing with a stick. Stop. You've ruined the flow. You've taken the, you know, you, first of all, you've made it extrinsic instead of intrinsic. She's playing for fun. Now she's playing for you. And now she's like, oh, mom is still there. Let me go play with her. She's more fun than the doll. There's so much desire to um, encourage and recognize the cool things that your kids are doing uh, that we sometimes overdo it. And, and then it's all the attention is back on us because you're the feedback machine. So try if you can to make a little bit of the feedback machine be the kid and the activity. But like I said, even better than that is first of all, a little screen time. And secondly, 
some other people besides just you with this child. There's, you know, that was with the movie Room. Remember, she was stuck. Yeah. Room was, yes, Brie Larson was stuck in a room. But that seemed like bad for every rich reason, um, not, not the least of which was that she was being, you know, held there by a, a maniac. But then she had to spend every single second with her five-year-old kid. Thank God there was a TV. You know, I'm, I have a, an almost two-year-old grandson and he comes over and we walk the neighborhood and nothing grabs his attention more than the eight-year-old boy playing basketball as we're walking by and he just stands there like, if only I could play with that kid. So I think that's really, a, you know, seek out whether they're younger or older, boosting them to be the leader or the follower, either way, mm -hmm. that's great. So oh, just- Wait, I was uh, gonna add one other tip, which is that um, when you have these kids together, it's, it's much easier for them to figure out something to do and not be constantly bothering you if there are loose parts around. And loose parts don't have to be actual toys. They can be, you know, the classic pots and pans. They can, cardboard box, if you can, everybody's ordering stuff from Amazon, order something big or get a, now's the time for a new refrigerator, right? <laughs> Just get a giant box and magic markers and maybe something to stab the box with, but no mumbly peg. And uh, you will have kids fascinated by it because there's something very, very primal about loving to make your own little cubby, your fort, your castle. And if they put stuff in there, it's, it's really just, it's just an entertainment center and it happens to be cheap and it happens to be brown and it's probably pretty ugly and you might not want it in your living room, but actually you do, you do. I, I mean, I feel like you, you've kind of maybe answered this question, but okay, huh? you know, cause you know, it, as, as we kind of started off with, you know, there's not the summer camps and the experiences, the wide range of things, you know, kids that kids were going to do and I don't want to ask this in terms of how can parents help, but what will make this summer more memorable? And I mean, um, first of all, this summer is going to be memorable. I don't think anyone has to worry about that. Maybe not for the three-year-old, but for yeah. everyone else, it's just so strange. I mean, there's no camp or there's a lot of places there's no camp and there's masks and we can't visit grandma except for Elaine who lives down the street. And, um, it's going to be memorable, but it will be particularly memorable if this is the summer that they, blank. Let them fill in that blank. This is the summer I learned to ride my bike. This is the summer I started walking the dog. This is the summer I realized how much I loved climbing trees or I loved rocks. I mean, this is the one gift that this summer is giving kids is the gift that we had as kids when there was less to do during the summer, which is free time. And you got to think about that toast butterer again. Without an empty swatch of time, which starts out being boring, and when you can be kind of whiny, and then work your way to something new that you figure out on your own, it's, it's not a transformative summer. So free time, as painful as it might be for you to watch them as they stumble along, I mean, we did, when we asked parents, what were they, uh, what were their kids doing? I mean, oh no, we asked kids, I mean, I can't even find a list, but it was like everything. What, what new thing are you learning that doesn't have to do with school? And it went from frogs, origami, coding, one kid's learning Bitcoin, which that seems really good or maybe really bad. Um, so many kids painting. One mom told me, this is a, a, an in-person interview, that uh, her child, who was 12, always said, mom, will you drive me to my friend's house? And her mom, who had three other kids, did so, but it was like, it was sort of like hostage situations. Like, okay, you know, I want, you want to go to her house and you're not willing to ride your bike and I want you to go there. Okay. And she would drive there and then thanks mom. And, and would go to the kid. And then since COVID, the girl has discovered that her bicycle is not punishment. Her bicycle is freedom. Oh. And the other day her, the kid took the bike for five hours to go visit and talk with friends. And that's, that's a memorable summer. That's the summer that you, you know, you discovered how much you have in common with your friend or you had a big argument and then you had to make up again with your friend. But it's the summer, we all love these stories when kids grow up, the Bill Gundestrom, you know, I can't pronounce it, but the idea of like going from 
child or baby into this new phase of life, the toast buttering <laughs> phase of life. And that's usually what summer was. It was a time of transition, especially if you went away to summer camp, you came back and you looked different to your parents and you had, you know, now you ate avocados and never ate avocados before and maybe you had a boyfriend. And this can be a big summer of transformation, but it does require parents getting out of the way some of the time because there has to be a little chrysalis where they're changing and then they'll emerge. So this is my own question. I'm gonna make this the last question. I get to do that. I thought that last one was such a great ending, but okay. Okay, right. yeah. so well this one, is, this one is kind of more philosophical and moving forward because a lot of us are really feeling the preciousness of yeah. the moment. And I know for myself, like, you know, we know a little bit more about each other, you and I, and the way, not just our, but everybody's calendar looked pre-COVID-19. <laughs> yes. And I know that like we're, we're all like in a lot of ways. I mean, I want life to get back to normal for everyone in good, healthy ways. Right. And then how do we hold on to some of the magic that we're feeling without a million fundraising events and a million this and a million that. So a little wisdom on that. I, I know yeah. I could sure use it. Okay, well, um, I think you actually embedded the answer in the question, this time is precious. I think that we didn't have a way to compare before this. You know, your kid is born and it's immediately baby soccer and mommy and me and sing along and then pretty soon it's swim lessons and then it's swim meets and then it's tennis. and there's almost been no time on the, I'd say, middle and upper middle class childhood continuum. And even if, even if you don't have means, there were generally after school programs that your child could, could enter often for free that were also very structured. There was almost no way to see the gift of free time. I mean, we were uh, at Let Grow, we were talking to a, a, a soccer group with 30,000 kids that had started after listening to us, it's so important for kids to have free time, it's important for them to play and organize their own game. They'd started adding 10 minutes of free time at the beginning, like the first 10 minutes of soccer time were now free time. And this was a revelation. The kids were coming early so they could have more of that time. They were making new friends. The coaches thought that the kids were playing soccer better because they were a little more creative and a little more fluid. And the kids had more better time. They weren't dropping out as much. So. It's almost a secret. I mean, a bizarre secret mm -hmm. hiding in plain sight that free time for kids, especially with other kids, is this vitamin that we had taken out of their lives and we didn't realize they were withering for, from want of it. It was like, uh, you know, like rickets of the soul. They just were getting depressed and anxious because they didn't have any time where they could figure out what they like to do or could goof around or could make a friend or could sing a song or could ride their bike and hang out with their friends for five hours, which I guarantee you is better than five hours of fill in the blank organized adult led activity. And so if you like what you're seeing in your kids, this new sense of self-direction, some confidence, maybe some goofiness, maybe a weird hobby that they're just falling into, you gotta give it space to breathe and space is time. I think, I think Einstein said that. And Einstein, by the way, spent his childhood making houses out of cards and doesn't seem to have hurt him. So the point is, don't fill up every afternoon. Resist this. De demand that the school, you know, that the, that the class is not, you know, you're joining a soccer league. I won't join a soccer league that's five days a week. You know, don't join it. Uh, wait, sorry. That was a lame ending. Not just don't join it. There are things that you can do, like organize with the other parents. Um, let's keep Fridays free for free play. Just don't schedule the piano lesson then. Don't schedule you know, some other uh, activity that can be shifted to another day. Keep Saturdays free or keep the weekends free or keep your vacation time free. But if you think that what your kid has gotten out of free time is significant, then the enriching thing that you can do for them is give them more free time. And I have to say, if you have a, a let grow play club before or after school, that's free time. When they're just goofing around, just playing with the loose parts, and the Let Grow Project is them free time. They go home and they do something on their own. So we have ideas. Um, there's a Let Grow Independence Kit that you can download that has a ton of ideas. But the basic idea is step back and give them some, some time of their own. 
I have to really thank you. I mean, first of all, it's so great to see you and I love your energy and your insights. And I think we'll do this again because it's been really enjoyable. Thank you so Seven much. Seven years, right? Like clockwork. So yeah, yeah, we'll do that. Anyway, um, to everyone who joined us, thank you for um, participating and asking questions. And you can go to parentmap.com and see upcoming talks that we're having next Monday on June 29th. We have Collective Coping, Healing Racial Trauma in Community presented by Families of Color Seattle. And then we also have um, a Gottman therapist. Uh, I'm not sure the date of that, but you can, oh, June 30th, the next day, Love in the Time of Coronavirus featuring Zach Brittle. So please join us. And again, thank you to our wonderful sponsors for supporting this effort. And everyone should go out and enjoy the sunshine. Right. And free time. Free time. Right. Thank you so much, Elaine. And thank bye to you. Seattle, beautiful city. Bye. Bye.